Welcome to everyone who's here. Uh, Tisha B'Av is a difficult day. Tisha B'Av is also a very powerful day and a very important day. Difficult because uh, we remember very harsh memories. I don't know where in the world all the people are, but uh, I assume in most places people have finished saying the keynote in which we basically travel through our history and relive all of the horrors and tragedies. But it's also a day that contains within a tremendous amount of hope because the purpose of the mourning is not simply to uh, to mourn and to cry, but to fix. And thus the title of uh, this afternoon's presentation, Urban and Tikkun, Destruction and, and Repair. Um, I had the privilege a few weeks ago uh, to guide a small group of people. I, I'm a tour guide as well as a, a teacher. And... Um, to guide a small group of people through Jerusalem's old city, uh, exploring the very themes and learning the very tech that we're going to learn now. That, uh, that tour was filmed, and I want to uh, thank uh, Michael Matityahu Glassman, who did the filming for us. And what we're going to be doing now is um, a combination, a, a sort of a virtual tour. You will have the opportunity to participate in this tour with the people who were there a few weeks ago. as um, as we show various clips from that. And together we'll also, uh, in between the clips, we'll have a chance to look at some sources, uh, some Torah sources, and maybe even one or two historical sources. Uh, if there's interest, maybe even a little discussion on the chat, and we'll try to understand uh, the messages of this day, what brought us to this uh, situation, and uh, therefore what we can do, and what we need to do in order to, to make the changes necessary to get out of the situation so that so that the prophecy of Zechariah that one day Tisha B'Av will be Lesasson V'Simcha will be a day of rejoicing so that that can be, so that that can be uh, realized. Uh, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that uh, this entire day's Web Yeshiva program is sponsored uh, in memory of Lilo Nishmat Nachman Ben Gedalia HaKohen, in memory of Mr. Norman Rubak by, Rubak, I'm sorry, by his loving family. Um, so uh, to get started, why don't we go straight to the, uh, to the first part of the virtual tour. And Ezra, if you can please play the first video. This will be about an eight minute introduction and then we'll come back live and we'll begin to talk. We're standing right now in what's called the Byzantine Cardo. Cardo in a Roman city was the main north-south street. Every Roman city had a large street, a large shopping street that went north and south through the city after Yerushalayim was destroyed by the Romans, first in the, what's called the Great Revolt that we're going to, and the destruction that we're commemorating during these three weeks, and even more so after the Bar Kokhba Revolt, which happened about 75 years later, Yerushalayim was completely destroyed, Nechrisha Ha'ir, in the words of the rabbis, and replaced with a pagan city called Ilia Capitolina. It was built as a Roman city. They literally destroyed the whole city and built a different city in its place. That city is the city that still remains. The streets of Jerusalem's old city today are the main streets of Ilia Capitolina, amazingly. It had a cardo, a main street. And this part of the cardo is kind of an extension that was built later on during what's called the Byzantine period. It was a big thoroughfare. You see here some of the original pillars on both sides. They were shops. Over there you have some um, artists' renditions of what it might have looked like, stores and things like that. And we have here also this mural that tries to represent for us what Yerushalayim might have looked like during this Byzantine period. And you see here a large shopping street with people, um, animals, etc. You see that Yerushalayim was a cosmopolitan city. People came from all over the world. You see people dressed in different types of clothing and looking very different. There's actually only one group that lived in this area at this time that's not in this picture. Who would that be? The Jews because the Jews were banned from Yerushalayim at that time. Yerushalayim at this point was a Christian city. The Byzantines, we call them, are just the Romans after they convert to Christianity. Yerushalayim was a Christian city, and Jews are not allowed. There was only one day a year that they made an exception to that rule. The Byzantines allowed Jews into Yerushalayim on one single day. They had to pay a special tax, an entrance fee, if you will, to get into the city. Anyone have any idea what day that was? On Tisha B'Av. And Tisha B'Av, the Christians allowed the Jews to enter so they could ascend the Temple Mount and sit near the ruins of the Beit HaMikdash and cry and mourn. 
And from a Christian perspective, that was worth doing because they were able to point to the Jews and say, look, these people are a relic of the past. They're finished. They are the past, and God's presence has abandoned them and moved on. That was the Christian theology at the time, at least. But had those Byzantines asked me, and had I been for my advice, and had I been willing to be honest with them, which I probably wouldn't have, I would have told them that that's the one, from their perspective, that's the one day a year that they should never let the Jews in. Our rabbis tell us in Masechet Tanit, call him it Abel al Yerushalayim, zocheh v'roeh v'simchata. Mourning for Yerushalayim is the one thing that guarantees we're going to come back to Yerushalayim. And history showed that that was true. For thousands of years, we mourned for Yerushalayim. On Tisha B'Av and all year round. We never had a wedding without breaking a glass. We left a square in our homes that was unpainted. Every single tefillah, every single birkat hamazon, we never stopped mentioning Yerushalayim. Every Yom Kippur, every Pesach Seder ended with Lashana Habab Yerushalayim. The Byzantines are long gone. And the mourning of Yerushalayim is what brought us back to Yerushalayim. And history repeats itself. About 1,500 years or so after those Byzantines, in this part of, we call today the old city, in this part of Yerushalayim, that was Yerushalayim, was what was called the Jewish Quarter already since the, probably the 16th or 17th centuries. And there was a war in 1948. And as I assume we all know, um, perhaps you saw my Web Yeshiva thing on uh, Yom Atzma'ut a couple of years ago on this. But uh, we fought a battle for Yerushalayim in 1948. We managed to hold on to part of Yerushalayim, but not the old city. The old city of Yerushalayim, the Jewish quarter, fell to the Jordanians several weeks after the state of Israel was declared. The last refugees were escorted out of Sion, just a few blocks from here. And this became enemy territory. The Jewish quarter was very badly damaged during the war. And after the war, not only did the Jordanians not rebuild, but pretty much anything that was left standing, they destroyed. They reduced the entire Jewish quarter to a pile of rubble. Even though they could have rebuilt it, they could have used it for themselves. They could have housed Arab refugees who came here, just as we took old Arab houses in places like Katamon and Baca and used them to settle Jewish refugees. They could have done that, but they didn't. The Jordanians intentionally left Yerushalayim in ruins, the Jewish quarter, in order to send a very clear message to the Jews. And essentially it was the same message that those ancient Byzantines were trying to say. You're finished. Your connection with the city is over. Don't even think of coming back. You have no homes to return to. The Jewish quarter of Yerushalayim is a pile of rubble. It's a testimony to what was. You have a past here perhaps, you have no future. And just like those ancient Byzantines, that very act of trying to erase our connection ultimately boomeranged on them. Because it took 19 years and we did come back after the Six Day War. And yes, we couldn't move right back into the Jewish Quarter. It took about 20 years or so to rebuild the Jewish Quarter. But in the end of the day, I don't want to say it this way, but we almost have to thank those Jordanians. Because from their attempt to disconnect us from Yerushalayim, and we had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time, but we wound up with two things that we got out of that deal. First of all, we were able to rebuild the Jewish Quarter as beautiful modern homes that are built to look old, but they're actually brand new. The oldest apartments in the Jewish Quarter are maybe 40 years old. I don't know how many of you have been through the Muslim Quarter, where the homes are hundreds of years old. That's what the Jewish Quarter looked like. That's what we would have had to come back to. Instead, most of us here, I don't know about you, but most of us can only dream of affording an apartment in the Jewish Quarter today. So we got beautiful luxury homes in Yeshivot and Batei Knesset out of the deal, but we got something else out of the deal too. Because before we built up, we were able to dig down. Um, an archaeologist named Nachman Avigad was brought here in the 1970s to conduct one of the largest archaeological excavations ever conducted in Israel. The entire area of the Jewish Quarter, basically, was one huge excavation. We learned incredible things about Yerushalayim. And then we rebuilt on top of it while leaving some of the most important parts, like this cardo, parts representing different time periods, to go visit. And therefore, just like those ancient Byzantines, the Jordanians' attempt to erase our connection with this city enabled us to expose the very past that they were hoping to erase and to, to make forgotten. So today Yerushalayim is rebuilt. Well, almost. It is rebuilt. Uh, not only the old city, but a magnificent new city. It's the capital of our country. But it's not completely rebuilt. 
There's at least one site, the most important site in Yerushalayim, that's still in ruins, and it's for that reason that we still have to continue. Even if we're already, in a large, to a large extent, we're already able to rejoice with so much, we cannot stop mourning yet. And so we must continue the ancient tradition in these three weeks of mourning for Yerushalayim. But how different it is to be able to mourn for Yerushalayim in a rebuilt Yerushalayim, when we're able to literally touch the past and connect and try to understand, not only to see and to feel, but to try to go beneath the surface and understand the messages. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so that's what we're going to do now. Um, let's jump right into things. Um, there's a, a source booklet that I used on that um, tour, which if you're interested, you can download from the uh, course page on Web Yeshiva. But for now, uh, I will show it on the screen, so there's no need to download it presently. Uh, and this is our topic, Alma Avda Haaretz, Why Was the Land Lost? Uh, what I'd like to do now, I'd like to learn uh, two brief passages from the Talmud, um, which um, uh, are not at first glance related to one another, even though I think we'll see by the end that they most certainly are, and um, both of which are quite en enigmatic. So the first is a, uh, uh, a Gemara in Masechet Yoma. Those who did Daf Yomi learned it uh, a few months ago, and it's also very well known uh, in general. The Talmud tells us, Mikdash Rishon Mipnei Macharev, why was the first Beit HaMikdash, the first temple, why was it destroyed? Because of three things, three problems that existed at that time. Three, the three cardinal sins of idolatry and uh, sexual immorality, incest, adultery, etc., and murder. Uh, I believe it was last year, uh, or maybe it was two years ago, I don't recall, but the first time I did a virtual tour for Web Yeshiva, it was last year. Uh, we actually spoke about this, uh, about those three sins. But today we're going to focus more on the second temple. So the, the Gemara continues, of Al-Mikdash Sheni, so the second temple, where at first glance things were much better. I'm told that you cannot hear me. Can you hear me now? I hear you. Yes? Okay. Uh, all right. So... The second, the second Beit HaMikdash, Shahayu Oskim, where, where things were at first glance much better. Uh, the first temple, they had all these terrible sins of idolatry, etc., and murder. But Mikdash Sheni, Hayu Oskim, but Torah of Mitzvot, Ugmilut Chasadim. In the days of the second temple, the people were involved in Torah, they were studying the Torah, they were fulfilling the Mitzvot, and significantly it says that they were involved in Gmilut Chasadim, in acts of kindness. So Mipnei Macharev, why was the second temple destroyed? The people were so much better. And now the well-known answer, the people had what's, let's use the standard translation, baseless hatred, or here they use the term wanton hatred. What does this teach you? This teaches you that that baseless or, or wanton hatred is, is just as severe as these three of the most serious uh, sins. And the Talmud adds, Rishayim Ayu, they were wicked, They thought that because they're doing all these, all these mitzvot, that they're going to be saved, but really they were wicked, and therefore, ultimately, uh, they brought a destruction upon themselves. This is a well-known Gemara. But if you read carefully, there's a powerful question. Um, because we need to understand what exactly our rabbis meant when they spoke about sinat chinam, when they spoke about baseless hatred. Uh, for many years, I assumed that these people were vindictive people. They were stabbing each other in the back. They were telling all kinds of horrible things about each other and cheating and stealing. And... But if you read carefully, this Gemara said that not only were they involved in Torah and mitzvot, if that was the case, if it, if it just said, Hayu oskim Torah mitzvot, but, so then I would assume that these were people who were um, perhaps echoing uh, the criticisms that Yirmiyahu and other prophets, and Yishayahu for that matter, also echoed, where they were you know, acting very religious and pious in terms of their worship of God, but they were mistreating other people. 
But this Gemara doesn't say that. This Gemara says that they were involved in Torah and mitzvot. Ugmilut chasadim. They were acting kindly to one another. They were giving charity. They were helping the weak and the poor. And yet it says that there was sinat chinam. And therefore, I think we need to dig deeper to understand what the rabbis meant by that. So let's put that question aside. I want to raise another question. And then we're going to dig deeper by going underground underneath the Jewish quarter to try to understand a little bit better about who these people were at the very time period the rabbis were speaking about. But first, another Gemara. Uh, also somewhat well-known. The Gemara Masechet Brachot describes the deathbed scene of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, one of the great leaders of Am Yisrael, the head of the Sanhedrin, at the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, and the very time period that they were speaking about when the Second Temple was destroyed. So he lived through the Churban. He was alive before the Churban. Later on in this presentation, we'll take a look at a Gemara that discusses his role in the events leading up to the Churban. Um, and he lived for many years afterwards. And eventually, he was on his deathbed. And the Gemara tells us, His students came in to visit him. He was very ill. They knew the end was near. He started to cry. His students said to him, they asked him, Mary Israel, Amura Yamani, Patisha Chazak, they mata boche, they said, Rebbe, why are you crying? Amarlahem, he said to them, Ilu Melat Lifne Melach Basar Vadam, Ayu Molichinoti. If I was being brought for judgment in front of a human king, a human king, Shayom Kanu Machar Bakever, today he's here, tomorrow he's in the grave, Shinko Esalai, and even if he gets angry at me, ain't Kaso Kasolam, it's not forever, because he's not eternal. Vimosrani, and if he puts me in prison, and that's not forever, because I'm not eternal either in this world. And if he kills me, even if he kills me, that's only in this world, but it's not eternal, because there's a world to come. And I would be able to potentially talk my way out of it or, or bribe him somehow. So even if I was being brought for judgment in front of an earthly king who has all these limitations, nevertheless, I would be crying out of fear of judgment. But now, but I'm being brought for judgment now. He knew, he understood he was on his deathbed. And I'm going to be brought for judgment in front of the king of kings, the king of king of kings, the supreme king of kings. Unlike the human king, he lives forever. In Koesalai, if he's angry at me, Kaso Kasolam, that's forever. In Mosrani, if he imprisons me, Isuro Isuro Lam, that's forever. Mimitani, if he kills me, he kills me also in the world to come. So that's also Mitato Lam, that's forever. And I can't bribe him and I can't talk my way out of it. And that's why I'm crying, he said. So at this point, I think we have a picture of a very pious person, a person who's, who's very, very um, exacting himself, someone who the rest of us would assume is clearly a very righteous person who has nothing to worry about, but righteous people know that all humans are judged uh, on their level, and he's, he's concerned. If that's all there was, then perhaps I'd understand the Gemara. But the, his next statement, I think, is quite puzzling. Velo Odi says, Ella... He says, there's actually, I see in front of me two paths. One path that leads to heaven and one path that leads to that other place. I'm not sure which path they're taking me down. So of course I'm going to cry. And here, we have to ask ourselves, as pious as Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka and Dadwi was, and as concerned as he was that he would be judged on the minutest details of potential misbehavior, uh, like a hair's breadth of deviation from the, from the correct way, that perhaps we can understand. But, but to that point that he really doesn't know if he's going to heaven or to hell, I don't know if I'm going to Gan Eden or to Gehinom, that sounds a little bit, a little bit of, exa- of an exaggeration. We have to ask also what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai meant by that. And we'll put that aside as well. But the, and then the Gemara goes on to some other things he told the students, but the punchline of the Gemara, his last words as he was about to leave this world are extraordinarily puzzling. As his soul was about to depart his body, he said to them, 
Panu kelim mipnei atuma. Quick, take the vessels out of this house so they don't become impure, which means he understands that his death is very imminent. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai's final words on this earth were then, Yehichinu kisei lechizkiyahu melech Yehuda sheba. Prepare a chair because we have an important guest. His Kiyahu Melech Yehuda is coming, coming to escort me on my journey. That's it. That's the end of the Gemara. What did he mean? His Kiyahu Melech Yehuda was a king who lived approximately, approximately over, over a thousand years earlier. No, I'm exaggerating. We lived about six, seven hundred years earlier. And why of all people, so maybe when a righteous person passes on to the next world, you know, he's an important person, they send someone from heaven to escort him, maybe there's some sort of midrashic idea here, but why, why Chizkiyahu? And the commentators struggle with this, nobody seems to understand, some suggest, we know that Chizkiyahu was a, was a great and righteous king, which he was, but there were many righteous people throughout the generation. Uh, some suggest that perhaps Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai had a family link to the Davidic dynasty. That itself is quite questionable, but even if it's true, so that perhaps one of his illustrious ancestors from the Davidic dynasty would have come to escort him, but that still doesn't explain why Chizkiyahu in Kvar. So why doesn't David Amelech himself come? And frankly, um, the few commentaries I saw that dealt with this um, you get the feeling that the question is much, much better than the answer. Until a great thinker I saw who lived in, in the 20th century and was privileged to, to see the state of Israel, and perhaps it was only from that perspective that he was able to understand this Gemara. But I'm going to keep you in suspense with that as well. So we have three questions we're looking for. What did the first Gemara, the, the Gemara in Yoma, what did it mean by sinat chinam, by baseless hatred, if the people were involved in acts of kindness? Ezra, if you can get the video ready, you can stop sharing already. Um, and in a minute, we're going to show the second video. I'll stop sharing. And Ezra, if you can queue up the second video, we're going to go look at it in a minute. Let me just finish my uh, little introduction here. So um, first question was, what did the Gemara and Yoma mean when it said, when it said, Sinat Chinam, if these are people who are involved in acts of kindness? Number two, number two, uh, why was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai so concerned that he's really not even sure if he's going to Gan Eden or to Gehinom? Most puzzlingly, what in the world did he mean when he said, Echinu kisei, prepare a chair for Chizkiyahu Melech Yehuda because he's coming to escort me. What we're now going to do is we're going to go down beneath the streets of the Jewish quarter. Um, you see already at the beginning of the video, I'm standing in what's known today as the Herodian quarter. That's the tourist name for the site. And the homes there date back to Herodian times, but afterwards as well, all the way up to the very time period that we're talking about. Some of the homes that are here were destroyed in the, in the Korban of the Beit HaMikdash. And, um, and just to orient those of you who are familiar with contemporary Yerushalayim, we're actually underneath in the basement, if you will, of Yeshivat HaKotel. Yeshivat HaKotel is a very, very large building in the old city, and it sits on top of these excavations. Uh, so let's take a tour. We have now a 12-minute video, so we're going to get the chance to look in great depth at some of the remains there. Uh, from the perspective of trying to understand these things, what we're doing is we're going to be visiting the homes of some of the people that lived in Yerushalayim at the very time period that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was in Yerushalayim and that the Gemara and Yoma was speaking about. So Ezra, please play the video. As the sign said, we've gone down three meters below street level and we've gone back 2,000 years in history. This is Yerushalayim at the end of the Second Temple period. And we have in this particular area houses of people that were incredibly well preserved. And we're going to be seeing here a number of houses. We're going to do this a little bit quickly. But let's try to, for ourselves, try to understand what's going on here. What you're looking, we're standing in a street. You can see here that there was a street with a drainage channel. And we're looking into the remains of a house. <laughs> this is the ground floor of the house. There's also a basement level below. And over there, there's the beginnings of a staircase that seemed to indicate that there was a top floor also, which did not survive. Um, by today's standards, this would be a, okay, you know, like a, a nice house, let's say for a middle class family perhaps. Um, but if we look at the way the house was decorated, if you look here, you could see mosaic floors. 
okay, you can see the remains of a nice um, mosaic, part, part of it's damaged. Uh, you see nice geometric patterns in different colors. I don't know how much you know about mosaics. Mosaics are not, there's no paint used whatsoever. It's all natural stone, it's an art form. You get natural stone, uh, which is naturally in different colors. You cut them into tiny squares and you bring artists and you make designs out of it. So everything here is done by hand. It's fairly expensive uh, artwork. Um, we also see over there the remains of, can you see what that is next to that mosaic over there? It's a little bit broken, but there was a bathtub. Okay. If you have mosaics, which are, which are expensive artwork on the floors of the houses, and you have a bathtub indoors. They didn't have running water back then, okay? Um, and we have a house that, by today's standards, is, is a nice house. In those days, everything was smaller. What can we say about these people? They were wealthy. wealthy. These are rich people, okay? But if we come over here, we can see something else about these people. One of the things they had in the basement level of their house, over there, you could see in the lit-up area, some kind of an underground, uh, like, a, like a storage room in the basement. There's also a water cistern over there. But anyone can figure out what this is? This is a mikveh. They had a mikveh inside their house. And what would that mean? That probably means they were kohani. And indeed, Josephus tells us that at this time, this area which was called then the upper city was inhabited largely by kohanim. Kohanim who need to have a mikveh in their house. These are people who work perhaps on a daily basis in the Beit HaMikdash. They're people who eat truma, people who even could bring home meat of a korban to their house for dinner. So we have rich people, we have rich kohanim. Okay, this house here, unfortunately, they weren't able to excavate the entire house because of the way the modern city is laid out. Um, probably beneath that, the street that's outside of this building uh, is a really amazing house. In this particular case, we can't see the house, but we're going to see some of the other houses. But what we do have for these people is their courtyard. Okay, you see here these pillars that look like marble. They're not actually marble, but they were made to look like marble. Stone pillars that surrounded a courtyard. The uh, official term for this is a peristyle courtyard. Here's an artist's drawing of what it assumedly looked like. Outside the house, kind of like a patio, surrounded by marble, or made to look like marble pillars. You also can see here the flooring that they had in their patio. Um, this is cut stone flooring with a special um, technique which is known as opus sectile. Um, I'm not into classical art. I don't know much about it, but I do know this. Like, for example, if you ask me about any other type of Roman flooring or some other Latin phrase, I will have no idea what you're talking about. But I know about opus sectile tiles because King Herod uh, liked this type of flooring. This type of flooring was found at the palace, um, Herod's palace in Yericho. It was found at Herod's palace at Masada. And recently, in the sifting of the remains that from the, from the Harabayat, I assume you, many of you are familiar, uh, about 15 years ago, the Muslims illegally built a mosque underground on the Harabayat, and they dumped all of this debris, which is being sorted through. Uh, so they found remains from the Harabayat of opus sectile flooring uh, with the very clear indication that that was the flooring of the Beit HaMikdash itself, which was also built by Herod. So if these people had flooring that was of the same standard and style as Herod used in his own palaces and in the Beit HaMikdash, so what can we say about these people? So earlier we said, okay, earlier we saw a house that we said by those days standard was a mansion. I can't, I can't see this house. I can only see the outside of it. I'm going to show you houses that by today's standards were, were mansions. So if earlier we said we were in a neighborhood of rich Kohanim, I think we can now say we are in a neighborhood of really rich Kohanim. Okay? Come over here. I want to show you what else we found here. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you look at this display case over here, we have here some cups and bowls and other uh, things that were used for food that are made of stone, not stoneware, not pottery, actual stone, meaning you take an actual piece of rock and you carve out of it stone, you carve out of it kaolin, vessels. Many, many, many such vessels were found in and around Yerushalayim. 
from this time, and nowhere else in the Roman Empire. See, usually when an archaeologist finds stone tools, the archaeologist says, oh, this must be from the Stone Age, right? That's how archaeologists date the ancient periods. We have the Stone Age, and then we have the uh, Bronze Era, and then we have the Iron Era, right? By, by the technology. Prehistoric people made stuff out of stone, and then when they developed the technology to make first ceramics, and then to metals and glass, so they're able to work with materials that are much easier to work with and much more practical. Why in the world would you have stone vessels in the Roman period? And the answer Elizabeth knows? I'm assuming they're not metabolism. You're assuming correctly. The only logical explanation, and this is pretty much what everyone agrees to, is that there's a halakha. The Mishnah even discusses clay evan. The clay evan are not mikabel tum'ah. Remember, we, we saw the people with the mikveh in their houses. These are people who, and, and today we, we associate mikvahot with women going once a month, but that's because that's pretty much the only practical, except for people going up to Harabayit, pretty much the only practical halachic application for mikvahot today. But back then, everybody can become tameh for various reasons. Uh, everybody in the family needs to become tahor because if you're going to eat truma, if you're going to eat maser sheni, if you're going to eat the meat of a korban, which could be eaten in these houses because it's inside Yerushalayim, you need to be tahor. And not only that, if someone's tamay and they pick up a, a cup, that cup has to go in the mikveh too. So on the one hand, you think it's hard keeping our dishes, you know, meat and dairy and Pesach or whatever. Imagine if we have to also, not imagine, I hope we soon do have to worry about these things also. But if you have a mikveh in your house, it can be very, very convenient. But if you have kelim which are immune to tumah, so that can also be a very, very significant. Um, this drawing is a replica, if you don't mind just shifting aside. This drawing is a replica. The original is in the Israel Museum. They found this on plaster in this house. But you can see somebody, almost like graffiti on the wall, somebody sketched uh, what appears to be, you see here only, this is what was found, these two pieces, and the rest is you know, an attempt to fill out the picture. It's clearly a picture of the menorah. As described in the Torah, the menorah with, with kaftorim and prachim, um, and two other things which I think might represent the Mizbeach and the Shulchan. Somebody's drawing pictures of the Beit HaMikdash. First of all, this was considered extremely significant because probably whoever drew these pictures of the menorah and the Shulchan or whatever saw the real thing. These were Kohanim who were working in the Beit HaMikdash. So this might be the most accurate picture we have of the menorah. But notice here an entire table made out of stone. Again, so the whole table doesn't, doesn't become Tameh. And another mosaic floor. Now here you can see a nicer mosaic floor. But I want to point something out about these mosaics that we didn't point out before. If you look at this mosaic, and again we said these are very expensive pieces of art. Especially at this time period, by the way. We're familiar with mosaics from later time, from the Byzantine period. If you've seen the mosaic floors in all the Bate Knesset that we excavated, those were hundreds of years later. By then, mosaics were expensive, but not so expensive. In the Roman times, mosaics were very expensive, because this was like cutting edge, like new art technique. But look at what, what, what do you see a picture of here? Absolutely nothing. Geometric. Just geometric patterns here, and the same thing in those two. Maybe that one had a little bit of flowers. No pictures of people, no pictures even of animals. Even though if you look at the Roman homes in this time period, those artists, the same artists that made these, do decorate with pictures of people and animals. And these people hired really expensive artists, and they said, just, just make me a nice design. And you have to ask why. And a theory, I can't tell you 100%, but we have other reasons to think as well, that at this time period, prevailing halachic opinion of the pasuk, lo ta'asel lecha pesel v'chol t'muna, they took it, today we, we, we certainly understand you can't make statues and worship them and probably there's a halachic problem making a complete three-dimensional representation of a human body. But beyond that, you know, even like partial statues and certainly two-dimensional pictures we don't seem to have any problem with nowadays. But back then, it seems they were stricter. And therefore, even though they hired expensive artists who certainly could have put pictures of people and, or animals, they refrained and used only uh, mosaic, uh, only geometric patterns and maybe a little bit of flowers. Okay, so now we're seeing another side of these people. 
Uh, these people are being very careful to observe the laws of Tara to the point that they're filling their homes with inconvenient stone vessels. They're making their fancy floors in strict accordance with halakha, and even maybe drawing pictures of the Beit HaMikdash to adorn the walls of their homes. So what can we say about these really rich Kohanim? They're also really religious, really rich Kohanim, right? who seem, seem to take halakha very, very seriously. Maybe we're seeing another side of these people. Someone asked me before, are they corrupt? How did they get so rich? Good question. I'm not sure I have the answer. But we seem to be people who seem to be very, very careful and very dedicated to halakha. Let's just see one more house. If, if the other houses would have been mansions by those day standards, and this one, I, the one with the courtyard, I don't know what it looked like, here's a, a house that would be a mansion today. From here to the end of this building was one house. Okay. Um, uh, Ezra, you can stop the sharing now, thank you. Um, I wasn't able to show on the video the next house because when we got down there, uh, the, they're doing some preservation work. It was all covered up. That's why I cut the video there. But I think, I think you get the, the point. You have to go back to Yushalayim at some future point to see that one. That's the most interesting of them. Um, but now that we have a little bit of a sense of the complexity of, of the people that lived in Yushalayim at the time, the people that remember, or at least some of the people that the Gemara was talking about when it said they were involved in acts of... In, and these were these wealthy Kohanim who lived in these houses. Uh, so what I want to do now, um, I want to read with you a historical source that, um, that uh, helps us understand what happened uh, in the months leading up, to, uh, leading up to the destruction. Okay, this is from the writings of Flavius Josephus the most important historian that we have of that time period. Um, a word about Josephus, um, for those who aren't familiar, he was actually a Jew, he was actually a Kohen himself. He was a general in the Jewish army against the Romans. And at one point when he was about to be captured, uh, he basically surrendered to the Romans and went over to their side, if you will. Um, and he eventually became uh, the Romans historian of the war. And he wrote a book that uh, clearly has certain biases. On the one hand, uh, he needs to make the Romans look very good because they're his patrons. On the other hand, he, he wants to make the Jews look good because he still felt very loyal to the Jews. Um, and those biases are important when reading him. And at the same time, um, it's also true that, um, that most of, uh, uh, that most of, what uh, he says that we're able to verify, most of what we're able to verify from what he says um, seems to be accurate. So here he tells us um, there was a bitter contest in Jerusalem between those that were fond of war and those that were desirous for peace. There was a big debate among the people of Yerushalayim. Uh, some thought, what happened was, let me just give the background here, what happened was the Jews rebelled against the Romans and the Romans decide to send their very best, they realized at some point that they had a serious rebellion on their hands. The Jews managed to take over Yerushalayim um, and basically to um, overthrow the, temporarily at least, overthrow the rule of the Romans. And the Romans decided that they couldn't tolerate this. They sent three Roman legions, which is a huge force, led by their absolute best general at the time, whose name was Vespasian. He later became emperor, became emperor in the middle of this war. He brought with him his son, Titus, who uh, finished the job when he, when he went back to become emperor, as we'll see in a minute. And uh, Titus himself is the one who finished uh, the war and eventually, eventually erected that famous arch, which stands to this day in Rome, and a picture of which I put on the cover of this uh, booklet here. And so Josephus tells us, uh, so, so what happened was they, 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 jo Vespasian decided he's not going to do this quickly, he's going to do this thoroughly. He left Yerushalayim for last. He let the rebels dig themselves in in Yerushalayim and even build more fortifications. He took several years before he got to Yerushalayim in order to conquer the entire rest of the country systematically. He started in the north, in the Galil, in the Golan, and went town by town and city by city and village by village throughout the north. Then he went down the coast. And only at the end, after everything else was fully secured under Roman rule, 
did he approach Yerushalayim and laid siege to a city which was very well defended, three massive walls, etc. And there was a debate in Yerushalayim. There were those who thought, um, this is it, we have the Roman Empire here, the most mighty empire in human history, certainly till that point and quite possibly till this day. Um, and what do, who do we think we're fooling? We really better negotiate and, and, and come to some kind of settlement. And there were others who, uh, who wanted to fight and, uh, you know, who remembered the great victories of the Maccabim a few hundred years earlier and who, who didn't want to, uh, didn't want to, um, to give in. Uh, if I had more time, I was hoping, uh, I just have to keep my eye on the clock because I have another video to play. So I wanted to have a little discussion on the chat, but I think I will, I think I will um, skip over that, unfortunately. But I can ask everybody to think for yourselves which side you would be on. These are debates that are not all that different than the debates we, we have today. Today we call it right wing and left wing. You know, should we be, uh, should we be trying to negotiate peace treaties? Should we be taking a more militant stance? How do we deal with enemies, etc.? And then Josephus tells us, at first, this quarrelsome temper caught hold of private families who could not agree among themselves, even among the families, they, there were disagreements. After which, those people that were dearest to one another break through all restraints with regard to one another, and everyone associated with those of his own opinion. I don't know about you, but I can certainly re relate to this. People who, you know, only want to talk to people who agree with them, and, and political ideological arguments that even rip families apart. They began to stand in opposition to one another, so that seditions arose everywhere, where those that were for innovations and were desirous of war by their youth and boldness were too hard for the aged and prudent men. There, Josephus may be showing his bias a little bit, that the uh, ones who wanted to fight the mighty Romans were these young, impetuous youths, and the wise old people knew better. Um, I'm not sure, well, although we'll see something somewhat parallel in the, um, in the uh, Gemara that we're going to look at in a minute. But in any case, there certainly were two factions and the tensions were great. But now look at the next thing he says here. And now all the rest of the commanders, and now all the rest of the commanders of the Romans deemed this sedition among their enemies to be of great advantage to them. The Romans had intelligence. They knew exactly what was going on. And they told them, they, 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 uh, and they were very earnest to march to the city, and they urged Vespasian as their lord and general in all cases to make haste, and said to him, the providence of God is on our side by setting our enemies at variance against one another, that still the change in such cases may be sudden, and the Jews may quickly be at one again, either because they may be tired out with their civil miseries or, miseries or repent them of such doings. So Josephus actually tells us, and he interviewed the, Romans, the Roman officers, there's every reason to believe that this is historically accurate, that they came to Vespasian and they said, this is our chance. The Jews are fighting with each other. We should attack now. Uh, before, maybe they'll work it out. Maybe they'll come to some kind of agreement and then they'll be united. Right now, we should, we should storm the city at this moment. But Vespasian replied that they were greatly mistaken in what they thought fit to be done. For that if they go now and attack the city immediately, they shall but occasion their enemies to unite together and shall convert their force. Now it is in its height against themselves. But if they stay a while, they shall have fewer enemies because they will be consumed in this sedition. That God acts as a general of the Romans better than he can do and is giving the Jews up to them without any pains of their own and granting their army a victory without any danger. And therefore, it is their best way while their enemies are destroying each other with their own hands to sit still as spectators rather than to fight hand to hand with men that love murdering. Vespasian said to his troops, according to Josephus, to his to his generals, that's why I'm the commander. That's why I'm the Ravaluf, the, the Ramatkal, the head of the army. And you guys are just still senior officers, but not the top. I know better. If we attack the Jews now, like you're telling me, that's what will make the Jews unite. All we have to do is sit here and let the Jews kill themselves. It would be a terrible mistake to attack the city right now. And Josephus adds later on, and now the commanders joined in their approbation of what Vespasian had said, and it was soon discovered how wise an opinion he had given. The Gemara Masechet Gitin uh, gives a parallel account that is strikingly similar in its what it depicts, um, but from the Jewish perspective. Shadrei Lavayu, I'll read in Aramaic, you have English translation there as well. Shadrei Lavayu, Laspasianus Kesar, they sent Vespasian 
to the city. There are some exaggerations in this Gemara that perhaps deviate from, from historical accuracy. Uh, it says here the siege lasted three years. It's unclear that that's actually correct. It's probably not. But in any case, um, there was a massive siege. That's what the Gemara is trying to say. There were three wealthy men in the city. Nakdimon ben Gurion, ben Kalba Sabu, ben Sitsita Keset, three wealthy men. Chad Amarlahu, one said to the people, Ana Zainalahu Bechiti I have I have tremendous collection of wheat and barley that I can provide provisions for the people to withstand the siege. Vechad Amarlahu Bidachamru de Milcho Mishra. And another guy said, I have wine and oil and and and, and salt, other necessary provisions. Vechad Amarlahu Bidachivei. And a third, the third one said, I have wood that people need to cook and to bake. Together we can provide rations to help the people survive. In what is probably also perhaps hyperbole, the Gemara says they calculated they had enough provisions to last for 21 years. But there were these, there were these um, zealots among the people who were against, who were against uh, Anything that could perhaps they wanted to go and fight the Romans directly. Amrulhu Rabbana and the rabbis who are presented also in the Skimara as the wiser elder ones said Napuk, although not all the rabbis agreed, but at least at a later point in history, Rabbi Akiva, for example, supported the rebellion against the Romans. So it's more complicated than the young people against the elderly rabbis. But at least in this particular case, the elderly rabbi said, Napuk Vinavid Shlama Bahadayu. We want to go out and negotiate with the Romans. Loshav Kinu and the zealots wouldn't let them out. Amrule, they said, Nepuk Venavid Krava Badaihu. They said, No, you should be helping us fight. Amrulu Rabbana and Lomistaya Milta. The rabbi said to them, You're crazy. You have no chance of success. And the zealots, in order to kind of force the rabbi's hands, Kalnehu Lahanu Amibri Dechiti Vitsari Vavi Kafna. The zealots burnt the storehouses where all those provisions were, and that led to a famine. They attacked and burned down the supplies that could provide sustenance to the people in Yerushalayim so that the people of Yerushalayim would have no choice, or so they thought anyway, to join them in what they were convinced would be a victorious battle against the Romans. And now the Gemara tells us in a huge uh, moment of historical irony, Abba Sikra, Reish Biryoni di Yerushalayim, Bar Achte de Rabban Yochanan and Zakai Hava. The head, Abba Sikra was his name, the head of all of the zealots, was Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai's nephew, his, his sister's son. Shalach leis Rabban Yochanan, two, the two opposite sides. Shal, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai sent him a secret message. Tabat sinale gabai. Come to me secretly, I want to talk to you. In the end of the day, it's his uncle, he has to go. Ata, Amrle, he said to him, You've lost control, are you crazy? You're going to kill everybody? They're all going to starve to death. Amrle, and look at this insight. The Gemara has Abba Sikra retorting to his uncle, Ma'i Avid, you're right, you're right, uncle. What can I do? If I do anything, if I say a word to them, they'll kill me. I've lost control of my own people. And I, for lack of time, I'm not going to read the, the next piece of the Gemara. But basically, he says, help me get out of the city. And he gives him a suggestion of how to do it. Spread rumors that you're sick and that you died. And let them smuggle you out in a coffin to be buried, and that way you can get out of the city. And in fact, the Gemara says they did that. Uh, it almost wasn't successful. The zealots were even willing to stab the coffin, but they played on their Jewish pride and said, you don't want the Romans to see you treating your rabbi that way. Eventually, they managed to smuggle Rabbi Yochanan and Mezaka out of the city. And now we get to the well-known key point in the Gemara. He had a whole conversation with him. He actually predicted that he was going to become the emperor. And at that moment, someone came and told him that he'd been appointed emperor. Amar Lay, let's just focus on this key last words here. Mezal Azilna the Inu Shachrina Meshadrana. I'm going to go now, but I have to send someone else to finish the job. He meant his son Titus. But Rabbi, I'm impressed with you. Buy me nine midi with the Etain Lach. Ask me a request, and I'm, I'm willing to grant it because I'm impressed with you, Rabbi. Amr Lay. And so uh, the uh, Rabbi Yochan said to him, famous three requests. Most importantly, the well known Ten Liyavne Vechachameha, the city of Yavne where Rabban Yochem and Zakai had already moved and relocated the Sanhedrin, the future of Torah Shabal Peh, the future of a Jewish people that would have to exist without a temple. He said, spare me the city of Yavna and its sages. And two other things also, Shoshulta de Rabban Gamliel, Asvata de Messiah and Rabbi Tzadok, I won't go into right now. But that's what he asked for. 
And significantly, there's one thing he didn't ask for. And later on, there was uh, criticism. Tari Alei Rav Yosef. Later on, Rav Yosef Be'itim, and some say it was Rabbi Akiva, which is significant because I mentioned to you a minute ago, Rabbi Akiva had a different political perspective. They quoted a pasuk, Meshiv Chachamim Achor V'Datani Yisachel. He did something stupid. He should have he asked to spare Yerushalayim. What it, even great people can make terrible, stupid mistakes. Rabbi Yochum and Zaka, you have the Roman Empire asking you what you want. Can you ask for Yav Nebuchadnezzar? What are you thinking? You should have asked to spare Yerushalayim. But who saw that? But Rabbi Yochum and Zaka himself thought, Dilma Kuli Hailo Avi, Batala Purta Nami Lohavi. Maybe, maybe if I ask for too much, I'll get nothing. And that's the end of this Gemara. Indeed, he was given Yav Nebuchadnezzar, and of course, Yerushalayim was destroyed. That's why we're fasting today. But now I think we can begin to understand a number of rabbis have pointed out that this might be what he meant on his deathbed when he said, I don't know which, which path I'm going on. But I think we also, right, he wasn't sure. He wasn't sure whether he made the right decision. This plagued him for the rest of his life. He had to make a split-second decision. Maybe I made the wrong, maybe I'm really guilty. Maybe Rabbi Akiva later on will be right when he accuses me of having sacrificed Jerusalem. He really wasn't sure if he's going to Gan Eden or Gehenna. We only have a few minutes. I want to show you one more video, which is um, we need to understand what he meant when he said, let Chizkiyahu, Chiz, uh, Ezra, if you can cue up the next video, please. Chizkiyahu Melech Yehuda is coming to, to, to escort me. What did he mean by that? And with that, I think we'll be able to pull everything together. So I want to take you back to another part of this tour. Uh, we're now outside again. Uh, and I took the people to a place where we'll un understand exactly who Chizkiyahu was and what was going on in his time during the period of the first Beit HaMikdash, about 130 years before the first Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. Ezra, please play the video. But I brought you here because this is one of the places in the Jewish quarter where one of the things that Nachman Avigad um, uncovered was so important that it was decided to redesign the, the city plan and make sure that this would remain visible to the public. You see here the base of a huge wall. It's about five meters wide, and it was, it's estimated that it was originally about eight meters high. So we're talking here not about the wall of a building. We're talking about a city wall, a choma in Hebrew, not a kir. We're talking about the city wall. The city wall, and it's dated to the 8th century BCE, as it also says, uh, oh, it doesn't say that over there, but uh, to the 8th century BCE. That's the time of King Chizkiyahu. And in fact, it seems that we can identify exactly what this wall is. So let's, uh, let's take a look. Oh, first of all, a little bit of a background. Oh, no, you know what? We can read a pasuk or two, and then we'll give the background. We're reading from Divrei Hayamin. Ashur Assyria was the major world power at this time. A few years earlier, during the days of King Chizkiyahu, remember there were two kingdoms, right? After Shlomo and after David and Shlomo, the country split into two. There was a southern kingdom, Malchut Yehuda. Chizkiyahu was Melech Yehuda. And there was a northern kingdom. When Chizkiyahu ascended the throne here in Yerushalayim, there was still a king, Hoshea ben Ela. There was still a king sitting on the throne in Shomron. But that empire, uh, the kingdom, Malchut Yisrael, was destroyed several years into Chizkiyahu's reign by the same Ashur, by the predecessor of Sancheriv, Shalmaneser who conquered and destroyed the entire northern kingdom, exiled what we call the ten tribes, or at least most of them. And now his successor, Sancheriv, was coming on another mission of conquest. He invaded Yehuda, and he didn't come straight to the capital, Yerushalayim. He went to the other cities, like Azekah, like Lachish, and he surrounded them and he destroyed them. Assyria had already destroyed the entire northern kingdom. And Assyria destroyed most of the southern kingdom as well. And all that was left was Yerushalayim. Vayar Yechizkiyahu kivasan cheriv ufanav la Yerushalayim. 
And Chizkiyahu saw that Sancheriv was coming and he wanted to destroy Yerushalayim too. Understand what this would mean. This would mean total Khurban. Yerushalayim is all that's left. The northern kingdom was destroyed and most of Malchut Yehuda was also destroyed. All that was left was Yerushalayim. Va'iva'atz im sarav listom et meimei ha'ayanot asher michutz la'ir va'ya'azrehu. And he spoke to his advisors and they told him and they came up with a plan to plug up all of the springs of water that were outside the city so that no water would flow outside the city. And you might ask yourself, why would they do such a thing? Why would you take a water source and, and stop it up? But if you read the next pasuk, it becomes clear. They plugged up all these things and they stopped the channel that was flowing under the ground. They said, right now there's water outside the city. We have an enemy coming to place a siege upon us. Why should we do that? Why should we allow them? Why should we allow them to come and to have water? Why should we give water to our enemies? And elsewhere in the Tanakh, it mentions a te'ala and a brecha. And I didn't put it on the sheet, but if you look in, in the parallel passage in Melachim, it talks about building a channel and a pool. And while for many centuries it was only vaguely clear what that means, today we know exactly what that means. We're not going to see it on today's tour, but anyone who's been to Ir David, which I assume is most, if not everybody here, has had the incredible opportunity to walk through the very tunnel described here. Chizkiyahu had incredible engineers and workers, and they dug a tunnel that completely diverted the water from the old part, the old pool where it had been near the edge of the city. And they diverted all the water into a protected pool inside the city called Rechata Shiloach, so that the Jews in the city would have the water in the siege and the enemy wouldn't. And then it says one more thing he did. The last pasuk on the page here. And externally, another wall. That's what this is. This wall is dated archaeologically to the time of Chizkiyahu. And Chizkiyahu is preparing for a wall, for a war. He fixes up the wall around the city. He, he, he builds a water system and fixes up the wall around the city. That's great for the people inside the wall. What about all these people? He's not going to abandon them. He builds Vilachutza Choma Acheret. He builds a second wall. Yeshaya also mentioned towers. There's a tower here also that you could go see. We're not going to see it today. But you can go underground here and see one of the towers that protected this wall. So it seems that what we're reading about here in Divrei Ayamim matches exactly what we're seeing here in front of us. We'll return to Yeshayahu in just one moment, but let's just finish the story. If you look here in Divrei Ayamim, I didn't put it on the page, or in the parallel passages in, uh, in Melachim, we're told that um, indeed Sancheriv did come. First he sent his general, Rab Shakei, to come and conduct psychological warfare, basically to climb up on the walls, to blaspheme the name of God, and to talk to the Jews and try to tell them to surrender because they have no hope, it's all finished and how Chizkiyahu's officers came to him with their clothes ripped and said, we don't know what to do. And how Chizkiyahu turned to Hashem and said a beautiful tefillah, which is written for us in the Tanakh. He prayed to Hashem, save your holy city, save your people. And Hashem sent the Navi Yishayahu, who was a contemporary of Chizkiyahu and who lived it during this time. Hashem sent Yishayahu to Chizkiyahu to tell him, your prayers have been answered, the city has been spared, and the enemy will not come into this city. And indeed the Assyrians did come. Sancheriv did bring his, his army and they did lay siege to the city. And the Navi tells us how miraculously in one night the Assyrian army was wiped out by some kind of a miraculous plague and Yerushalayim was spared. Okay, uh, Ezra, you can stop the share. Thank you. I only have one minute left, so we'll have to do this quickly. But I want to share with you an explanation that I saw in the name of Rav Yitzhak Herzog, the first chief rabbi of Medinat Yisrael. And as I said, perhaps it takes someone who's lived through the miracles of our generation to really understand what was going on here. But uh, Rav Herzog connected what we just saw from the time of Chizkiyahu, and he said, now I understand Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, who, who for decades was plagued, did I make the right decision? I had a chance 
to ask Vespasian. He says to me, what do you want? I asked for Yavne v'chachameha. Maybe I should have asked for Yerushalayim. That debate is going to go on throughout history. I don't know if I did the right thing or the wrong thing. And I really don't know on my deathbed if I'm going to Gan Eden or to Gehinom. But in his final moments on this earth, he had a sense of resolution. He was able to see, Chizkiyahu Melech Yehuda himself is coming to me, to escort me. You know why? Because look at what Yechizkiyahu did in building that wall. The people who criticized Rabbi Yochum and Zankai were saying, you should have done what Chizkiyahu did. You should have just waited it out. You should have trusted in Hashem. Instead, you handed Yerushalayim to Vespasian on a silver platter. And he said, no. Chizkiyahu Melech Yehuda is coming to escort me because he knows that my situation is different than his. And you know why? Because of what Vespasian knows. Because Yerushalayim has already destroyed itself. There's nothing left to save. The people destroyed itself. And that, my friends, is what is meant by Sinat Chinam. It wasn't that they were petty people who just cheated each other and hated each other and, and gossiped about each other and said, this one is jealousy. No, these were holy people. They were. You saw how careful they were about Tuma and everything. These were people who deeply cared about the Beit HaMikdash and they even cared about each other, but they disagreed. They didn't know how to deal with this. They had disagreements, just like we do today on political issues and ideological issues, how we're supposed to be running our nation, how we're supposed to be dealing with our challenges. And that is great. That is not the problem. The problem is when, the, instead of talking about these issues, you burn down the storehouses. And so Vespasian knew it best. Yerushalayim is already destroyed. And Rabbi Yochum ben Zakkai knew there's nothing left to save. And that's why all he could do was say, this is, 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 is already, is already a, a, a fact. We can only do is, is, is prepare for a lengthy galut and prepare to build for tomorrow. Here it is a few thousand years later. We're still mourning that destruction, but hopefully we can learn the lessons and implement them in our own time so that we can complete the process, as we said at the outset, of, um, of, of, of return and uh, uh, complete the process that we're already able to see of Yerushalayim Simchata. May it be that next year on, on Tisha B'Av we'll be celebrating together uh, in real life, not virtually, and uh, in, in an actual Beit HaMikdash, and not merely in the ruins of what was. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Really beautifully done, really. Thank you. So creative. Amen. Thank you. Amen, amen.